Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and software engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about pipeline hazards. Now, I guess, obviously, the first thing we should do in a lecture about pipeline hazards is to define exactly what we mean by a hazard. Well, here's a pipeline timeline diagram and two assembly language commands. The first command um, loads a value into register 5. And the second command takes the value in register five and adds it to the value in register four. Now, if we take a look at our pipeline timeline diagram, uh, from the perspective of the load command, we fetch the load command from instruction memory. We read registers, our um, ALU doesn't do anything, but we have a, a little time slot allocated for it anyways. We read the value pointed at by the X register pair from memory. And then this is where we, whoops, this is where we load, um, or let's say copy value into register five. However, the hazard problem becomes apparent when we take a look at our second command. So um, with respect to our add command, um, and remember each one of the vertical slices of our pipeline diagram represent one clock cycle, right? So this first vertical slice represents what's hap what happens in the first clock cycle. And this vertical slice represents what happens in the second clock cycle. And if we take a look what is at what's going on in clock cycle, um, clock cycle two, we fetch our add command. And then in clock cycle three, this is where add reads the registers that it wants to work with. So this is where we read values from register R4 and R5. However, this highlights the hazard problem because register R5 isn't ready yet. It's not until clock cycle for five that the value for R5 is updated from the previous load command. So we're using R5 and it's not ready yet. It hasn't because load hasn't finished. And this is basically the definition of a pipeline hazard. It occurs when we're trying to use a register that, or, or region in memory um, similarly, that hasn't yet been updated from a previous command because it's still winding its way through the pipeline. So, hazards and so this lecture is going to be all about how we deal with hazards and so whoops wrong direction and so one kind of simple way that we could um, fix the problem is to just insert a series of no op commands which stands for no operation a series of no op commands to buy the load command a little bit of extra time to finish its work before the add command needs the, the value in R5. And so here's a pipeline timeline diagram where I've inserted two no op commands. And so in clock cycle one, we fetch the load command from instruction memory. In clock cycle two, we read from the register. Three, we do nothing. Four, we read the memory. And in clock cycle five, we update register five. Now, a no-op command will be fetched from instruction memory, but after that, nothing happens in any of the um, following stages. Same for this no-op command, nothing happens in these following stages. And so it basically just kind of fills the pipeline with, with nothing. And it's not until clock cycle four that we fetch the op or the machine language instruction for add. And then we read R4 and R5 in clock cycle five. So we've delayed, um, we've delayed when add accesses register five and we bought time for register five to be updated. So update R5. 
So this fixes the problem, this solves hazards. But as you can imagine, or as you can sort of see from this diagram, it also kind of defeats the purpose of using pipelining in the first place. So if we have to fill up the pipeline with these no op commands, we take a throughput hit, right? So rather than having one command come out of our pipeline every clock cycle, we have one command come out at clock cycle five, Clock cycle six and seven don't really do anything for us, and it's not until clock cycle eight that we have another useful command. And so a lot, so we, we take a, a penalty in throughput, and a lot of what this lecture is going to be about is to how to is um, to present strategies to deal with hazards without taking that um, throughput penalty. The term pipeline hazard is any event that prevents us from completing one pipelined instruction per cycle. Like a perfectly operating pipeline is cranking out one result every single clock cycle. Um, and then anything that causes us to deviate from that is referred to as a hazard. And there are basically three different types of hazards that we're going to talk about. Um, structural hazards, data hazards, and control hazards. Now structural hazards are kind of the, the ones that we're going to talk about the least amount because um, they don't exist as long as we've designed our hardware properly. So um, structural hazards occurs when a stage is asked to do um, two or more incompatible things. So for example, if um, we asked our microarchitecture to perform a fetch instruction and a data memory operation in the same um, clock cycle, but the instructions, um, the machine code and the data memory happen to be in the same um, RAM memory bank. So you can't, you know, fetch a, a, a machine language instruction and do a data memory read write if it's the same memory bank that you're working with. And um, this is fixed by making sure that we use separate instruction and data memories, which is um, the solution used in most microarchitectures. Either we actually literally have um, different instruction and data memories, like, um, you know, for example, in little 8-bit microcontrollers, like the PIC microcontroller or the ones used in Arduinos, or we have um, separate sort of intermediate instruction and data memories, and that's what's used in sort of ARM cores and Intel chips. Okay, so the first type of data hazard that we're, or sorry, the first type of pipeline hazard that we're gonna spend a, at least a little bit of time on is the data hazard. And a data hazard is actually, um, we illustrated it with our first hazard example. And basically a data hazard is when one command wants to use a result that isn't ready yet because the command that has come before it isn't finished. And um, we sometimes refer to these as read after write or raw data hazards. And that's when, you know, we have a, uh, an instruction that needs to read something um, that has to be written uh, by a, a previous command and it, it hasn't, um, it hasn't happened yet. And so there are basically three solutions for, for data hazards. And the first one we kind of already looked at with our no op example, and that's stalling. So stalling is basically just pause the pipeline, freeze it, um, wait for the first command to finish executing, and then once the result is ready, then we let the next command proceed. And that is, um, I mean, it works, but we don't like it because it sort of defeats the purpose of having a pipeline. If we just wait, we're always waiting for that first command to finish before the second command begun, we're kind of back to the same situation we had with our single cycle processor. Another solution um, is called forwarding. And with forwarding, we basically forward values between intermediate states of the pipeline. So as we're going to see, you know, often the result that we need by, or the result that the next instruction needs actually is ready. It just hasn't been fully written back to its register yet. So for example, it might be available at the output of the ALU, um, but it's still gonna be two more clock cycles before it is actually written to its register. And so we can be kind of sneaky and we can take the value at the output of the ALU and send it um, back to a previous stage in order to, uh, to make use of it. So it makes our logic design tricky, 
But as we're going to see, it allows us to um, eliminate data hazards in a lot of cases without any performance penalty at all. Um, the problem with forwarding, though, is that it doesn't always work. And we're going to see an example of that. And so the third solution is the solution used by most processors. And it's a combination of forwarding and installing. So um, we use forwarding whenever possible. But in the few cases where forwarding doesn't work, then we stall. OK, so here's an, another pipeline timeline diagram, this time with three assembly language instructions that have a lot of interdependency. And so this is going to be like the, the one common example that I'm going to use throughout the lecture to illustrate how we implement stalling, forwarding, and then the combination of stalling and forwarding. And so first of all, the first command is an add command that modifies register 26. So um, if we follow through our timeline diagram, we fetch the instruction, we read the registers, we do our addition, we have a blank time for um, memory access because this command doesn't use memory. And then this is where we update register 26. However, the very next command is a load register 5x command. And if you recall, register 26 is one of the two registers that make up the x register pair. And so in, so if this is clock cycle, one, two, three, four, five, and six. In clock cycle three, this is where we would need to read register 26, right? So um, register 26 is not updated by the add command until clock cycle five but we need to read it way back here in clock cycle three for the load command. And then finally, um, the last command is an or command that ors register four with register five. Now, the load command is going to move through its steps and it's not until clock cycle six that we update register five. But if we take a look down here at the or command, the OR command needs to read a value from register 5, and it needs to do it here in clock cycle 4. So read register 5. And so lots of problems, right? So each command, um, the, the second and third command, both need values from previous commands that aren't ready yet. And we are going to use stalling, forwarding, and then a combination of stalling and forwarding to fix these problems. So the first solution is stalling. And stalling is, again, basically freezing the pipeline to give the um, previous instruction a chance to finish. And um, the stalling of a pipeline is controlled by something called a hazard unit. And a hazard unit is basically a functional block within the control path. And you know, I'm not going to get into the actual logic design of um, a pipeline control path, but this information is in your, your textbook in Harris and Harris, and it's worthwhile just kind of taking a look at it just for um, curiosity's sake, because um, it, it's pretty cool. Like, you know, even in this lecture, this stuff is pretty complicated, I think, and, you, you know, it takes a while to sort of think about it. And it's pretty cool then to sort of go into your textbook and see the actual um, digital logic that would be used to, to implement something like stalling or forwarding. Um, so I'll be referring to the hazard unit, but we're not going to look into its design in, in detail um, in these lectures. So the hazard unit is basically has two jobs. It's responsible for detecting when we need to stall, and then it's responsible for actually doing the stall. Um, or implementing the stall. And so the way that detection works is the hazard unit basically tracks the destination registers for all of the commands that are going through the, uh, through the pipeline. And if it sees a command that needs a register that hasn't been written yet, then it stalls. It stalls that command until the register is, uh, is ready. And you know, in my uh, previous example, I used no-op commands to sort of fill up the pipeline. The cool thing about our pipeline design is we actually don't have to like 
shovel in actual commands to sort of stall the pipeline, we can actually do it just by freezing the pipeline registers and just not updating the pipeline registers and um, disabling the ALU. So that's kind of nice because then we don't have to like be messing with um, instruction memory or, you know, somehow, you know, diverting instruction memory and feeding things into the pipeline. So in this example, we're going to see how stalling fix, fixes the hazard problems in our example. So we're using a pipeline timeline diagram, and we're just going to go through this diagram clock cycle by clock cycle. So in the first clock cycle, clock cycle number one, we fetch the instruction for add. No problem. That's all we do. In the second clock cycle, we read uh, for the add command, we read our register values. So whatever value happens to be stored in R26 and R2, that's no problem. And we also load the machine language instruction for our second command, which is load R5X. Now, the hazard unit is going to be inspecting the machine language, every machine language command on determining whether or not a hazard is going to occur. And in this particular case, the hazard unit detects that a hazard is going to, going to happen. So it knows that we're operating on register 26 up here. It knows that this, the register 26 is not going to be ready until clock cycle five. And it also sees that this command needs register 26. And so, what the hazard unit is going to do is going to stall the pipeline and give the add command the time that it needs to finish updating the value in register 26. The way that it stalls the pipeline is by freezing the pipeline registers. So in clock cycle five, or sorry, clock cycle three, what happens is the hazard unit freezes or locks pipeline registers one and two. And so the effect of this, uh, or and, th and this has an effect on all, f or a different effect on the different commands in our pipeline. So first of all, the add command is unaffected. So on, um, on clock cycle two, we read our register values in clock cycle three, we're doing our addition operation with our ALU totally fine. However, in clock cycle three, what happens is the values that um, we what happens in, in in for the for the load command sorry is uh, we prevent the load command from from proceeding. So this load command is not reading the correct um, register values because R26 isn't, isn't ready yet. But we basically, by freezing registers one and two, and remember I'm referring to these guys, registers one and two, we basically isolate this stage. This stage has incorrect data right now, but we basically isolate it by freezing the pipeline registers on either side. Down here on clock cycle three, and I'm just going to give myself a little bit more room here. On clock cycle three, we also, is also when we read in the machine language code for um, the OR command. But again, pipeline register one is frozen, so we can read that um, instruction in, but nothing is going to happen because the, the register that we're feeding it into um, is frozen. So we're not um, we're not yet um, letting the, the OR machine language instruction sort of propagate down the pipeline. And so what happens is we basically have frozen stage one and two in place by freezing our pipeline registers. And the way I represent this on the pipeline timeline diagram when we proceed to clock cycle four is that I basically sort of show a repeating copy of stage two for the load command and a repeating copy of stage one for the OR command. And this, this is meant to represent that both of these stages are, are basically frozen and prevented from operating, 
while up here the add command is allowed to continue merrily along its way and um, uh, finish its execution. So in clock cycle four, we go through the, the memory stage for the add command. This, this stage happens to be unused, but again, there, there's time allocated for it. Now, when we get to clock cycle five, what happens is we write our result into register 26. So the hazard unit at this point knows that clock cycle five is where we have the correct result now in register 26. And so what happens here is we unfreeze pipeline registers one and two. And what that recognizes is that in clock cycle five, we write um, our value to uh, register 26. This is also where we can read the correct value for register 26. So we can unfreeze pipeline register two and allow that result to propagate down the pipeline. By the same token, now that we freed up um, stage two, we can also unfreeze pipeline register one and allow it to propagate down the pipeline. So if we now look at our load command, in pipeline six, we pass through the um, ALU stage. ALU isn't used, but we allocate time for it anyways. In clock cycle seven, we read the value pointed to by the register pair. And in clock cycle eight, we write our um, correct value to register five. So have we fixed all our problems? Not so fast, actually, because there's still a remaining hazard problem for the or command. So back here in clock cycle five, we We unfreeze registers one and two. And that means the or command in clock cycle six can read its register values. However, this is where or command needs the updated value for R5. And R5 isn't gonna be ready until clock cycle eight. So the hazard unit in clock cycle five refreezes pipeline registers one and two, okay? And so poor, the poor old or command has been basically stalled or frozen twice. And so when we go to clock cycle seven, or is frozen. When we go to clock cycle eight, the hazard unit knows that this is where we um, write our value into register five. This is where we can now read the proper value in register five. And my diagram's getting pretty messy here, but I'll just clean it up. This is where we unfreeze pipeline registers one and two. And at that point, since or is the last command, it can go ahead and um, in clock cycle nine, do its ALU, clock cycle 10, it bypasses memory, and then clock cycle 11, it, uh, it finishes. And so this, you know, successfully, um, successfully deals with our hazard problems. It's a little bit more elegant than manually putting in no ops, you know, because we can um, do this in an automatic way. The hazard unit can implement stalling just by freezing and unfreezing our pipeline registers. But this basically has the same effect as adding no ops. So whenever you freeze the pipeline, you prevent it from sort of churning out commands once every clock cycle and you take a throughput penalty. So while this works to resolve the hazard successfully, it also isn't great for our throughput. So now we're gonna move on and take a look at forwarding and forwarding is a technique that allows us to get around hazards without incurring the same penalty or throughput penalty as stalling.
So forwarding is basically a way to avoid stalling. So we, we, we don't like stalling, it slows our pipeline down, we, it hurts our throughput. And forwarding is a way to share information between stages of our pipeline so that we can avoid having to stall. And let's illustrate this with our example. So here, um, you know, we have the, the same three commands that we worked on with our stalling command. We've got, you know, clock cycles, one, two, three, four, five. And if we take a look at the perspective of our load command on clock cycle two, we load in our load command. And in clock cycle three, this is where we need the value of R26 plus R2, right? So up here, this add command, again, is R26 plus R2, and then it stores the value back in R2. And so since um, the, the load command down here wants to use R26, it needs access to this, the value of the old value of R26 plus whatever is in R2. And it needs this in clock cycle three. And before we said, oh yeah, with stalling, you know, it's not gonna be available until we write back to the register um, way over here in clock cycle five. But that's not exactly true. The value of R26 plus R2 actually is available in clock cycle three because we're up here at the ALU stage and the ALU stage is responsible for calculating R26 plus R2. And so this value is already there. The value exists. And so we don't really have to wait until the value is sort of written back to the register. We can just maybe um, snatch it and make use of it. And that's basically what forwarding is all about. And so what forwarding does is if a command needs a value from an earlier command and that value happens to be available in intermediate form. You know, the command hasn't completed, but it still has that intermediate value. We basically share the information between um, pipeline stages. And so we take the value of R26 plus R2 and we forward it down to the load command, which down here needs the value of R26 plus R2. Now, at this point, it's super useful and important to remember that we are not dealing with three parallel separate data paths here. So we don't have three parallel data paths and we're somehow forwarding um, information between these parallel paths. We only have one physical data path. And so let me draw that data path um, down here. So we've got, you know, our instruction memory, our pipeline register, then we have our, our register file, pipeline register, and then we have, you know, our our ALU, and again, sort of our pipeline register. Now, it's really important to remember that in clock cycle three, we have here at the output of our ALU, we have the value R26 plus R2, and down in the previous stage, this is where the load command needs R26 plus R2. So this is where, um, and I'll just provide a little bit more information here. So in clock cycle three, this is where add produces the value R26 plus R2. And it's the previous pipeline stage in the register file where we need the value of R26 plus R2. And so when I show up here, us forwarding a value from one pipeline stage to another, what we're actually doing is we're taking the value R26 plus R20 plus R2, and we're feeding it back 
to that stage. So forwarding is actually a feedback operation. It basically, in order to implement forwarding, the hazard unit recognizes that we've got a value sort of further up the pipeline that we need um, further back on the pipeline, and we just send that value back um, a little bit earlier than it would normally be written to its registers. Now, this is probably, for many of you, this will be a great time to pause the video and just really think about this for a second. Because, you know, even though in the pipeline introduction lecture, you know, I talked about how, okay, this is just one data path, it's not three data paths in parallel, it's super easy to still, you know, once we start working too much with these pipeline timeline diagrams and we start showing all these multiple data paths, it's very easy to forget that, right? So um, if this doesn't make sense, if this notion of forwarding being implemented as kind of like feedback doesn't make sense, pause the video here, rewatch the previous lecture. Think about exactly what a pipeline physically is it's only one data path and um, the stages of the the data path are just processing multiple instructions just like we only had one kitchen for the cookies and we were um, baking many batches of cookies at the same time we only have one data path for the instructions and we're just processing many um, instructions at the same time okay so let's continue with our example So we were able to deal with our first hazard using this forwarding idea. What about our second hazard? Well, if we look down here at the OR command, it's, I need to clean this diagram up a little bit here. Delete. So it's in clock cycle four that the OR command needs register five. And unfortunately, the load command in clock cycle five is here at this ALU execute stage, which it doesn't, um, doesn't use. It's not until clock cycle five that we have the new value for, for R5. And so in this particular case, for the second hazard, forwarding doesn't work um, because we can't, you know, in order for forwarding to work, the value that we need has to be available in the current clock cycle. So it needs to, we can look upwards in our sort of vertical slice and see, okay, is the value available anywhere? If it is, we can feed it down to the under, um, uh, an earlier stage. But if the value is not available anywhere in clock cycle four, we can't look into the future and we can't go back to the past. And so in this case, forwarding doesn't work. And so this, this highlights the, um, this example highlights both the benefits and the drawbacks of forwarding on its own. So the benefit that we saw in this example was we were able to get rid of our first hazard without any penalty in throughput, right? So by taking our value, our R20, our R26 plus R2 and forwarding it down to our load command, we had our add command come out at clock cycle five and our load command come out at clock cycle six, no throughput penalty. However, we weren't able to solve our second hazard with forwarding. And so it, this turns out that basically in order to be both efficient, as efficient as possible resolving hazards, but also robust, we need to combine forwarding and stalling together. And basically we're gonna use forwarding whenever possible, but when we can't use forwarding, we'll just stall the pipeline just long enough for us to be able to forward the values. Okay, so, you know, again, stalling and forwarding, how do you combine them? You basically use stalling as a sort of a, a last um, a measure of last resort, forward when you can. If you can't forward, stall only as long as it takes for forwarding to work. And so let's, you know, again, redo our example here. And we know, um, you know, we, we load our add command and on clock cycle three, um, load needs register 26 plus R2. 
we know that that's available. And so as we've seen before, we forward register the value of register 26 plus R2 down to the load command. And then it can make use of that value for the X pointer pair. And so no change, basically forwarding worked just fine. However, we weren't able to do forwarding for the OR command because this is where we need the new value of R5. And we don't have the new value of R5 up here because we are doing the, um, we're at the, ex the ALU execute stage. This should, shouldn't be gray, it should be white. And so what happens here is we stall. So if we need a value and we don't have it and it's not available anywhere else during clock cycle four, we stall by freezing uh, pipeline registers one and two. And then in clock cycle five, the new value for R5 hasn't been written to the register yet, but it is available because we read the new value for R5 out from data memory here. And so we can forward the value of R5 down to the OR command and then uninstall. And then the OR command is able to proceed as, as usual. So you can see that even in the case of the OR command, forwarding has a benefit because when we were using just stalling by itself, we had to stall, I believe it was for two consecutive clock cycles. Now that we've got forwarding in the mix, we only had to stall for one clock cycle. And so we can see that we've been able to execute our commands um, so here we completed our add command on clock cycle five. Here we completed our load command on clock cycle six, so no throughput penalty there at all. And down here we completed or on clock cycle eight. So we did incur one clock cycle penalty, but it wasn't as bad as using just stalling. And so you can see that the combination of forwarding and stalling um, really kind of gives us a nice compromise between the best possible throughput we can get as well as robustness for the cases where forwarding just simply won't work. So the next thing I want to talk about are control hazards. Now control hazards are a little bit different than data hazards. Control hazards are caused by branch instructions. Now a data hazard occurs when there's some data that our command needs that is, you know, being sort of processed by an earlier instruction and that earlier instruction isn't finished yet. It's not quite through the pipeline. And so we, we just need to get that data and we can either stall or forward as we've seen. Control hazards are a little bit different. Control hazards are caused by the uncertainty regarding what happens after a branch statement. And so let's take a, a look at this sort of simple assembly language command. We're comparing two registers, three and four, and then if they're equal, we jump down here to loop end, and um, if they're not equal, we add a value to R3, and then we jump back to loop start, and we do the compare again, right? So it's a relatively straightforward loop, but let's now think about this in the context of what we've learned about pipelines. So pipelines are all about sort of, you know, each time we put a command into the pipeline, we need to chase it up with the commands that follow immediately afterwards. But we don't know which commands to put into the pipeline until we know the result of our branch decision. So if, um, so we, we do our compare, we do our branch equal. If R3 and R4 are not equal, we need to fill the pipeline with an add command and a jump command, and then we go back up here and then we put the compare and the branch command into the pipeline again. Um, however, if they are equal, we jump down here and we fill the pipeline with the or command. So this, um, this uncertainty about what commands to load into the pipeline are referred to as control hazards. And there are two ways to deal with 
control hazards that we're going to be we're going to talk about. Um, the first one is our old friend stalling. So the the most obvious way um, to deal with control hazards is just to just stall the pipeline, wait for our decision, and once we know the decision, then we can load the appropriate commands into the pipeline. Um, a slightly more elegant technique is known as branch prediction. And branch prediction is based on the assumption that our whatever our we're going to assume that the this time the loop is going to do exactly the same thing that it did last time. That's the simplest way to, to do prediction. And prediction is something that um, most high speed processors today do. Um, mo most processors these days won't just sort of stall on uh, on conditionals. But but anyways, we'll we'll introduce stalling first as sort of our solution number one, and then we'll go on to talk about prediction and see exactly how prediction works. So this slide shows stalling. Now, we know that branch statements change our the content of our program counter, right? The address stored in the program counter, and that's how we jump around instruction memory. And I'm going to assume for the just for the purposes of you know our class that we change the program counter, branch, branch instructions change the program counter at the memory rewrite stage. And so basically what we've got to do, um, the, the stalling solution, again, the easiest solution, if we um, encounter a branch command, we basically stall uh, the pipeline by freezing pipeline register number one. And so we, we stall, stall, and then here we have our decision from our, our branch um, our branch command, our program counter is updated, and then we unfreeze. And then continue on with whatever command we want to execute. So conceptually simple, very robust, this is absolutely going to work. But it does mean that every time, you know, for our particular example here, every time we encounter a branch statement, we incur a three clock cycle penalty. This is too expensive, um, particularly for cases where, you know, let's say we've got a loop that executes a command thousands or tens of thousands or millions of times, right? So, so there are many examples in programming where you have a loop that just keeps doing the same thing over and over again. Um, again, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of times. And to incur a three clock cycle penalty each time we hit a branch statement at the top of this loop would be, like I said, too expensive. And so branch prediction is, you know, um, for the purposes of this class, and there, there's different ways that you can um, implement branch prediction based on sort of probabilities and stuff like that. But the simple version of branch prediction that we're gonna study for this class is basically based on the assumption that the loop is, you know, this time the loop is going to do whatever it did last time. And so for the example of this for loop, you know, we've got a, a print statement here. And so the first time we go through the loop and then we go back up to the top and we hit the our branch statement, the hazard unit is basically going to say, you know what, I'm going to assume that we're going to do this loop again. So I'm just going to preload the loop with or preload the pipeline with whatever um, code is within um, our loop and you know if that decision turns out to be correct amazing um, let's just keep going super fast um, outputting one instruction per clock cycle um, if it ends up being wrong we've got a bunch of incorrect information sort of in our pipeline and we simply delete that information and this is known as flushing the pipeline. As it turns out, flushing the pipeline is basically equivalent to, is basically gives us the same throughput penalty as stalling. So um, branch prediction is almost always a good idea because we um, most of the time get a, a benefit, but when we exit our, our loop, we do incur a penalty, but it would have been the penalty that we would have got if we implemented stalling anyway.
Okay, we're going to do a pipeline timeline diagram example for the um, uh, control hazards using branch prediction. And our branch prediction algorithm, as I mentioned, is basically, you know, we're going to assume that what the loop did last time was what the loop is going to do this time. And the assembly language little program that we're going to be using uh, is shown here. We've got a compare statement. Uh, we compare registers three and five. If they're equal, we jump to the end of the loop. If they're not, we add register four to three, and then we jump back to the start of the loop. And so I'm going to go show you two slides. The first slide shows what happens when we get our guess correct. So um, this is the correct guess scenario. So we perform our comparison. And then we do our branch statement. Like I said, it's not until here that we actually update our program counter with our decision from the branch statement. However, what our algorithm is going to do, it's just going to assume that um, we are going to sort of loop back. Because um, let's assume that this, this loop sort of executes many times. And so we're going to work with the assumption that we are going to jump back and execute the loop again. And so that means that you know, within the loop, we need to add uh, register four to register three. Then we need to jump back to the start of our loop. And then we do another one of our comparison statements. And so if we do, in fact, jump back to the start of the loop, then in clock cycle five, when we update our program counter, we can basically validate that this was the correct thing to do, this was the correct thing to do, and then we load in our compare command and then just do the, the whole thing again. So now what happens if we guessed wrong? Well, our example starts out the same, right? So we, we load in our compare command, we load in our branch command, again, we don't know until clock cycle five what the program counter um, result of our decision is going to be. And so we merrily sort of load in add, we load in jump. Oops, I don't quite have, sorry, I wasn't quite fitting on there. We load in add, we load in jump, <coughs> excuse me. And in clock cycle five, we were about to load in copy, but let's say we, we take a look at the, the decision of our branch command, <coughs> excuse me, and we see that in fact, rather than executing the loop again, we jump to um, loop end. And so that means that we need to flush all the data associated with this add command all the data associated with loop start. We don't load um, our compare command, and instead we load in our or command. And so that means, you know, our, our or command will um, finish execution. I've got a stall in here that I shouldn't, that's just a copy paste error. Um, the or command finishes on clock cycle nine and our last sort of successful branch command um, finished on clock cycle five. And so, or sorry, finished on, on clock cycle six. And so we have one, two wasted clock cycles uh, because we guessed wrong and we had to flush two commands from our pipeline. So we guessed wrong. We did get a throughput penalty in this case. But again, it's the same throughput penalty that we would have gotten had we implemented stalling in the first place. So apologies about the, the slightly messy version of compare down there. But um, we, we really just flush the add command, the jump command, and we load the or command, and we experience a two, a two clock cycle penalty. Okay, now I'd like to conclude our discussion with just a few kind of general wrap up comments regarding how pipelines are implemented in different processors and also some other ways where we can make processors quote unquote faster. 
Um, in like throughout our lecture so far, we've assumed a five stage pipeline for the MIPS microcontroller. And the reality is that different processors will choose different stages for their pipelines. So for example, there's um, an AVR 8-bit microcontroller that's part of the, the Atmel family of microcontrollers that's used in the Arduinos um, that uses a, a two-stage pipeline. So just instruction fetch and then everything else. Um, the ARM Cortex-A57 has 16 pipeline stages and the reason why you can get 16 stages is just imagine that all of the, you know, we, we just further chop up the five stages that we um, used in the examples in this lecture. So, um, you know, take apart the ALU and chop it into a bunch of, of stages, you know, additions faster than multiplications and stuff like that. Um, you know, register reads could be chopped up a little bit as well. Uh, and so, if you work with a range of processors, you'll see a range of um, pipeline stages. So what are some of the other ways to make a processor go um, a little quicker? One uh, way is to use something called multi-cycle processor design. And this is the idea that, you know, again, it's based on the, the notion that some operations are quicker than others, right? And so even in the sort of pipelined examples that we worked through in this module, we still did define our clock period based on the slowest pipelined stage, which typically um, are, the, are the memory operations. A multi-cycle processor basically um, allows the processor to have a different number of clock cycles for each one of the instructions. And so if a memory access takes a long time, rather than having that take one clock cycle, we, we could have it take four. And then the, um, like the ALU operations, which typically are a little bit quicker, could then be just given one or two clock cycles. And, uh, you know, again, the, uh, the AVR, um, 8-bit microprocessor is an example of a simple multi-cycle processor where most instructions either take either one or two um, clock cycles. Another technique is something called a superscalar processor, and this is where we actually add parallel hardware to our data path. So I've said over and over again, pipeline designs do not involve adding parallel data path hardware. We're just sending a bunch of commands through one data path all at once. Um, however, superscalar processors do actually add parallel um, data paths. Uh, the ARM Cortex-8, for example, is what's known as a dual issue superscalar processor, and that means it has two parallel data paths. And the last um, way that we make microprocessors faster is using something called multiprocessor design. And this will be familiar to most people who have been at least a little bit involved in purchasing or building personal computers. So um, most people, if you've, if you've done that, are aware that we have what are known as multi-core processors now, dual core, quad core, stuff like that. And um, basically, that involves putting multiple actual full-blown processors inside the same chip. So imagine taking our micro architecture and just making full copies of it within the same chip and having all of these processor copies essentially connected to the same um, main memory. And there are sort of two different kinds of multiprocessor design. Symmetric multiprocessors are ones where the processors are all identical. And this was um, the case for the earlier Intel multi-core processors. So if you had a dual core or a quad core processor, those were basically two or four versions of exactly the same processor. Um, but what we're seeing now is a trend towards heterogeneous multiprocessor design, particularly for applications, as we start to get more um, interested in energy efficient computing, either you know, in the case of a smartphone, if we wanna make our batteries last longer, or in the case of a supercomputing cluster where cooling is an issue, we like to have the ability to switch between a high performance processor and a lower performance but more energy efficient um, processor. And that's what heterogeneous multiprocessors are, are, are all about. In particular, 
Um, if you look into ARM core processors, they've got a big dot little architecture that they refer to, which incorporates both an energy efficient um, core and a high performance core onto the same chip. And you can switch back and forth between the two.